guys, welcome to the Vertical Life Church online experience. I'm Kelly and I'm so excited to welcome you to our global community. We want to awaken and empower you in your walk with Jesus. And so we're gonna bring you some powerful worship and an awesome message. Check it out. Hi, my name's Tyler James. Uh, I normally play guitar right over there in the shadows. Uh, but I also lead our Versus Middle School Ministry. Um, it's been awesome. We've been doing it for a couple months. And the craziest thing, it's the aw- most awesome thing I think I've ever experienced in real life, like right in front of my eyes. We prayed for Alyssa Troyer's knee. She had pain this morning. She couldn't even bend her knee. Like she couldn't even put her shoe on. Her husband had to put her shoe on. And uh, we prayed for it and God miraculously healed it in the moment, like right there in front of everybody. They started shaking and they felt it. All the middle schoolers felt it pop. Like they were like, her knee's shaking, it's, it just popped. And then she stood up and was like, had, like doesn't even know what to do. And so I shared, I had a crazy testimony in my life this week where an old friend of mine, I saw him, I've been ministering to him for the last week about some crazy testimonies of healing in my life. Um, he had chronic back pain for 10 years. And so I've been talking to him, talking to him, putting, putting healing in his mind, like, hey, you have access to this. Like, this is an opportunity. God still does this. Like, the God of the universe is the God of the Bible, and the God of the Bible is still moving. He's real and ever-present. So I've been talking to him about it. He came over for coffee on Thursday morning. Um, I prayed for him right there in my kitchen. Nothing crazy, nothing about me. Laid hands on his back. God, we ask for full restoration in your back. And that was it, I mean, in a nutshell. And he felt great, didn't really have pain in the moment, um, and, but he felt awesome, went home. I texted him the next morning. First time in 10 years he's woken up without back pain. Totally healed. So I shared that, and the power of that testimony prompted Alyssa to say, hey, I want that. I want that. I want some of that. Don't we all want some of that? It's available, it's here, it's, it, we're ready. Like, I'm ready. So. That, the power of your testimony is incredible. It just led a girl to healing for the first time and encounter with the Holy Spirit she's never had. So we're about to sing a song about how God keeps getting better, keeps on getting better from back pain to knee pain to new life, addictions healed, full restoration. It's there. It's available today, right now. You don't have to wait. My buddy wanted to wait till next time. And I said, no, we're doing it now. And he got 10 years of freedom in a moment. Like it's here, I'm serious, it's here. He keeps on getting better, he keeps on getting better, he keeps on getting better. Let's just say that. You keep on getting better, Lord. You keep getting better, Lord. You keep getting better. Take us out of the box, Lord, take us out of the box. God, we believe, we ask, we ask, we believe, we believe in the power and authority of the Holy Spirit. God, fall on us in a new way. Awaken and empower us, Lord. Awaken and empower us to a new, fresh anointing of your spirit, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. Let's go.
was sharing testimony this morning of healing that happened in this building. Just start thinking in your life of all the ways that you've seen God move. Just let them add up. Let them add up in your head right now. Let's just say there's this and this. I woke up this morning in a bed that was mine, <laughs> in a home that I live in. I had food this morning. Just begin just like, like literally just start thinking of all the things, even today, that just start adding up to adoration and praise. Thank you, Lord. Every day, every day. Keep on getting better. Now come on. Keep on, keep on, keep on. Thank you, Lord. Keep on getting better. You keep on getting better. You keep on. Keep on getting better. You keep on getting better. You keep on. vocals let's just sing it out how great is our God and how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great and how great is our God one more time how great Oh, how great is our God. 
there's just something on this right now. Then when we turn our affections to Him and we look to Him, we lift Him up in this place. It's not about us. It's not about our agenda, but it's about Him. Come on, just lift your hands. Just sing it out. How great He is. How great He is. How great He is. We engage with you this morning and we sing how great you are. How great is our God and all we'll sing how great and how great is our God. One last time, how great He is and how great is our God and sing with me how great is our God and all oh, we'll sing how great, how great, yes, is our God.
Hey guys, we're gonna keep worshiping, but I feel like the Lord wants to deal with the spirit of discouragement. And I'm saying this to myself too, this is something that has been heavy on my heart. Um, but in Joshua, it says, be, or, um, <laughs> be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. He says, do not be discouraged. And if you know the story in the Bible, this is right before Joshua is gonna lead people to take the promised land. And they have to march around the city of Jericho seven times before they see it fall. And I don't know how big that city was, but how many laps in do you think they started battling a spirit of discouragement and the Lord's grace and in His kindness before they even set out on that journey, He said, do not be discouraged. Do not be discouraged, don't give up. And I just feel like there might be people who have come in today who are just hanging on by a thread and you wanna give up. But I would just encourage you, just like Davis was singing, the King is in the room and are you going to bow to your circumstances? Are you gonna bow to the things that you can see? Are you gonna bow to King Jesus? In the first service, Andrew read something, I think it was from Philippians that was saying, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And are you gonna wait until the day that that's forced upon you? Or can you look right now at your circumstance or the things that aren't going right, the prayer that you've been praying over and over and over again that you haven't seen an answer to, are you gonna bow your knee to that this morning? Are you gonna bow your knee to the name of Jesus? And so Jesus, we just lift you up and we just exalt you over every other name this morning. We give you praise and honor, not because we feel like it, and not because things are going our way, but because you deserve it. And because you are worthy, you're the only one that's worthy. And so King Jesus, we just bow to you this morning. And we just say that we won't be discouraged. And guys, you know what it says after that? Why you don't have to be discouraged? It says, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And so Jesus, we praise you that you are with us this morning and we just choose to surrender to you and to bow our knee to you. And so guys, I would just encourage you as we continue to worship this morning, don't let this opportunity pass you by. Don't let this opportunity pass you by to bow your knee to the King instead of to your circumstances, to bow your knee to the King instead of hopelessness, instead of despair, instead of anxiety, instead of depression, because those things don't have the final say, Jesus does.
right now as the, the train of his robe fills the temple. In Old Testament, when a king conquered a kingdom, the train of his robe, they took that conquered king's robe and sewed it to the end of the conquering king's robe. So his robe would get longer the more that he wins. So you could tell how successful a king was in battle by the train of his robe. And we're seeing that the train of his robe fills the temple. The train of his robe fills the temple. He's won every battle. He's the only one worthy of praise. He's the only one that's never lost. That is the God we serve. That is the king who chooses to come in this room right now. That's who we're looking at. That's who we're singing to. Sing great are you, Lord, one more time. We sing great are you, Lord. We sing great are you,
you're beautiful I see your face, you're beautiful So beautiful, so beautiful I see your face, you're beautiful You're beautiful, you're beautiful I see your face, you're beautiful We're so glad to have you as a part of our online family today. We couldn't put on this experience without your generosity and support. If you'd like to partner with us as we continue to spread the gospel, there are two ways that you can give at Vertical Life. You can text any amount to 84321, or you can go to verticallife.info and click give. We believe that God has something awesome to teach us today, so let's prepare our hearts as we continue in our service with an awesome message. How you guys doing? That's good. So good. I love the so good. It is good to see you all this morning. I'm excited to uh, to be here and just to share a little bit of my heart with you. If you've been coming for any period of time, you know that most of the time when I get up here, you probably already know what we're talking about. And you're right. We are going to be talking about evangelism and discipleship today. We actually just came out of a series where we looked at the seven letters in Revelation to the seven churches. And just like so much thanks to Jeremy for all the time and effort and study and prayer and preparation that he put in to deliver us those messages because they were awesome. I don't know if they were good for you, but I felt like they were amazing for me. And one of my biggest takeaways that I took out of it was just the reality of the persecution for Christians and the reality that we have to be obedient to Jesus in a culture that is hostile towards Jesus, no matter the suffering that it may mean for us. And this is something that it confronts me. Like hostility against Jesus is something that confronts me. I do try to live my life kind of out loud for Jesus. I, I'm not perfect at it. I mess up all the time, but I do come up against this hostility against Jesus. In fact, this is a couple months ago, I was in downtown Raleigh and uh, I had an appointment down there and I was walking through the city. I was done with my appointment. I was going to my car and I was coming up to an intersection. And right as I kind of walked up to the intersection, there's a crosswalk. I saw these two kind of like gruff, burly, manly construction guys that were sitting on the other side of the, of the street. And I just felt like God was prompted me. I want you to engage these guys in conversation. And so usually I like to try to maybe think about it a little bit. Like, well, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? But as I was walking, the crosswalk turned to walk. I was like, oh, dang, I'm like 15 feet away and I don't have time to stop. And I kind of got over to him. They were right here. And I kind of was like, not today. And just kept walking. I was just like, nope, God, sorry. I can't do this one. I'm not doing this one. And I just kind of kept on walking. I felt very clearly God was telling me, stop and talk to these guys. And I just chickened out. Not much longer after that, I was at Chick-fil-A. I had four, I have four children. They were all in the back of the car. I was at Chick-fil-A. I was going through the line. We're getting ready to take the order. And the girl comes up to take our order. And she's holding the, you know, the iPads that they have there. And I looked down at her forearm and she had these like perfectly lined cuts all up and down her forearm. And immediately just, I had so much compassion for this girl, like 15, 16, 17 years old, and she's cutting herself. I had so much compassion for her. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like if only she knew how valuable she was, she wouldn't be doing this to herself. Like she does not, she doesn't know my Jesus. And I was like, all right, so I'm placing the order. I'm like, oh, I gotta say something to this girl. And this all happens in like a 30 second window. And I'm thinking like, what do I, is it, can I say something? Can I, can I talk about this? Is this inappropriate? Like, is, how uncomfortable is this going to make her feel? Like, what do I even say after I, after I bring it up and I say something to her? And she takes my payment. And I'm thinking, like, all right, I'm going right, to do it. I'm going to do it. And she gives me my credit card back. And I look at her and I say, hey, 
as if I have something to say to you, get ready. Hey, she said, yeah. And I said, have a good one. And I drove away. <laughs> it happens all the time. Does this ever happen to you? Like, are you ever at the store and you just see a person and you're like, I feel like I should buy their groceries. Or, or maybe, maybe you believe in laying your hands on the sick and, and sick people are going to recover. The prayer of faith is it heals sick people because God's grace comes. Maybe you believe this and you see someone that you're like, they don't have to keep using the wheelchair and you want to go pray for them. Or you just feel this prompting to go share the gospel with somebody, but you, you just maybe don't know how to get the conversation started. You start to get in your head a little bit too much and you end up just going about your grocery list and leaving the grocery store and never saying anything. Or like, do you ever talk to like a coworker, maybe a family member, maybe a neighbor, and you're having this conversation with them because like you want to be a good intentional neighbor and, you, and they start talking about like the pain point of their life. Like, yeah, you know, this just happened. And you just see, and you're like, man, if only you had the hope that I have in Jesus, you would not have to be that discouraged. Like I, I need to tell them about my Jesus so that you can have the same hope that I have. And you wanna get the conversation like to the kingdom and what could be for them in the relationship that they could have, but what forever even reason, you just don't actually get to it. Like, am I the only one or does this happen to more people than just me? It happens. What I want to do today is share some scriptures with you to challenge you. I'm trying to challenge you today just to be upfront. But I also want to encourage you today. And I want to remove every excuse that we have for not talking to the two construction guys across the street or not talking to the girl in the Chick-fil-A checkout line. So if you have a Bible, you can grab that. We're gonna read through some passages right now. And what we're gonna see is a common thread through these passages. We're gonna see that Jesus gives his authority. We're gonna see that Jesus sends them out. They obey and God's kingdom comes through their obedience. And so if you are a note taker, you can write these down. If this is something that interests you and you would like to study this further, you can write down Mark 6, 7 through 13 and Matthew 10, 5 through 15. We are going to look at Luke 9, 1 through 6, but these are three different gospel writers account of the same thing. So if you want to dive into this, you can look at all three of those. This is what it says in Luke chapter 9. It says, and he, Jesus, called the 12 together and gave them power and authority. There it is right there. Jesus gave the 12 power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out. There it is. He sent them to do what? To proclaim the gospel and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. In whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed. They went. They were obedient to the command to go. They went. And they went through the villages. And what happened through their obedience? The gospel was preached, and there was healing everywhere. So we see that Jesus gave the 12 his authority. He sent them. They were obedient and God's kingdom came through their obedience. Now, to some of you, this is going to sound crazy, but I have conversations with people about this and legitimately an excuse is, yeah, Wes, but those were the 12 apostles. Those are like this different breed of human beings that we're seeing that with. Okay, you can have that objection. We're going to jump right down to Luke chapter 10, next chapter. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Here goes 72. Let's see what happens. And sent them on ahead of him. There is the sending. He sent them two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Verse 8. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. 
Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it would be more bearable on, the day for, on that day for Sodom than for that town. And then drop down to verse 17. The 72 returned. So there's the obedience. You don't return without going. Jesus sent them, they were obedient, and they went. They returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. There is the kingdom coming through their obedience. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority. There it is with the 72. He gives his authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So there we see it. The same thing with the 12 we see with the 72. Now we're going to jump to Matthew 28. It says, and Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore. In other words, all authority and heaven and earth has been given to me. I'm giving it to you. Go with my authority. See, sending everyone listening to him in that moment with his authority. He is commanding them to go. To do what? Make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of of the age. So right there, Jesus is giving a command to people and telling them to go with his authority. Then he goes on to say, everything I just commanded you, I want you to teach throughout the generations for everyone to obey. So we saw Jesus command the 12 to go. We saw him command the 72 to go. Now he's commanding this group of people and telling them to go and saying, everything I've commanded you, I want you to teach everyone after you to do the same. So he has commanded us to go, and he has given us his authority to go. But notice, all we see in this passage is the authority being given and the command to go. That's because if we are obedient to go, if we are obedient to go, we will see his kingdom come through our obedience. In the same way that the 12 saw it, in the same way that the 72 saw it, in the same way that generations of Jesus followers before us have seen it, if we go with his authority and we are obedient, we will see his kingdom come through our obedience. Now I have a question for you. You have just seen all these passages. So if you believe that God has given you his authority, if you believe that God is sending you, if you believe that your obedience will bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, I want you to raise your hand and hold it up for just a minute. All right, everybody just take a quick little look around this room because this is good. What this is called, this is called unity of faith. We all believe the same thing. Ephesians 4 says that the purpose of the church is to equip the saints for work of ministry until we all attain unity of faith. And so what I see right now sitting in front of me is a room of people that collectively believe, we believe that we have the authority of Jesus. He's sending us into the world. And if we go, his kingdom will come. People will be saved. People will be healed. Demons will flee. People will be restored and made whole. We all believe that together. So that's a good day. That's good news. So this is my question. How are we doing at it? Are we going? Are we being obedient to this call that Jesus has given us? And I'm asking this question for a few reasons. One, like, I'm only 38 years old. I'm not super old, but when I look at the world around me, I see more confusion than I've ever seen before. Like everyone is confused everywhere. Like I see more division than I've ever seen in my life. I see more acceptance and celebration of sin than I have ever seen. And I see so much hopelessness in the world. People are so hopeless because they don't know our Jesus. 
And people literally wake up every day. They take a shower, they get dressed, they go to work, they take the kids to the sports, they hang out with their neighbors. They do life every single day and they are all looking for the same answers. Every human being is trying to answer the question, am I valuable and do I matter? Everyone, I don't care who you are, you wanna know if you're valuable and you wanna know if you matter. And guys, we have the answer that they are looking for and his name is Jesus. And there are so many counterfeit answers in our world, so many. You can find answers to those two questions in just about anything. But there is only one way, one truth and one life and his name is Jesus. So I wonder how are we doing when it comes to fulfilling the call that God has placed on our lives? I also ask this question because I feel like in this time where the world needs the church more than ever, I see this brand, I guess, of Christianity that I'll call self-centered Christianity. I think that's an oxymoron. I think that's the word that you use. Like self-centered Christian should not be words that are put together. Is that an oxymoron? Okay, thank you, English people. I feel like I see like this self-centered Christianity. Let me explain. Like I think that there are, I'm going to oversimplify this, but there's these two kind of sides, if you, if you will, of Christianity that are meant to be happening in conjunction with each other. On one side, following Jesus is an extremely personal, like about me thing. Like my relationship with Jesus is my relationship with Jesus. And I, I'm supposed to be being conformed into the image of Jesus every day. And that comes through a process of submission and yielding to him and letting him point out the sin in my life and being humble enough to repent and pursue holiness and go, and go in the direction of Jesus. To be transformed by renewing my mind is very much about me and it's about you and him. And so Christianity very much has this side to it that's like, it is, it's between you and it's between Jesus. But then there's this other side, this like swing of the pendulum to the other side where Christianity is about getting work done. There is a harvest and it requires work. Every farmer in the world knows that the harvest season is the season that requires the most work. And it's so easy to kind of get stuck on like this swing of the pendulum over here where it's all about me. And it's like, I need to grow and, and, and I need to figure out like my calling and I need to, all the, like all these things that are just all about me. And if we never like allow the pendulum to swing to the other side, to take risks for the kingdom, to allow our faith to produce action because faith without works is dead. It's pointless. It means nothing. Then it's easy and it's subtle to get stuck in a self-centered Christianity where my Christianity is all about me and it's not about the world. And that's a dangerous, dangerous place to be because we are God's plan for the world. The answers that people are looking for are contained and held within our experience with Jesus in our lives. And they are just waiting for us to go and share the good news of Jesus that we have. And so my question for Vertical Life Church, my question for you, how are you doing? It's a he- to me, it's heavy. And like, it's, there are seasons of life Like, believe me, I am in the middle of a season of just pruning and pressing and like refining where it's very much, I'm figuring out me, right? Those seasons exist, but I also feel the pressure in that season of like, man, I need to like, let's go. Like, let's go a little bit more than we're going right now. Cause I'm, I'm trying to figure out too much stuff right now. Like, let's go, let's get it done. You know what I mean? And so it's okay, like I, I get it. And what I wanna talk about to, 
to end our time together, I'm not like five minutes away. Don't feel like I'm just about done. But what I want to talk about to end our time together is I want to talk about what I feel like the biggest key is to living the life that we all believe we're supposed to live. And I think the key to that is death. The key to living the life that we are called to is death. I'm going to read Acts 1, 6 through 8 to you. I love this passage. It says, so when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That word witness is the word martus. And that word martus is where we get our English word martyr. A martyr is someone who sees an event and reports what happened. It's a person who makes a solemn statement under oath concerning their religious beliefs that results in their death. So another way to read this passage is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will testify to me by your death. The way that we testify to who Jesus is, the way that we share our witness with the world around us is through death. Matthew 16, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself. The hearers, when Jesus said this, would have known Cross equals instrument of death. That's what they would have thought. It was, a Rome, it was a Roman death sentence. When Jesus said, take up your cross, they immediately would have thought, pick up the instrument of my death. For whoever will save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Revelation 12, 11, And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, which is usually where we stop that passage. We stop it right there. We have conquered by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And that's true. But why? Because they loved not their lives, even unto death. It was the fact that they did, that we won't love our lives, even unto death, that we will conquer by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Our testimony is that we are willing to die for this Jesus that we love. John 12, 24. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, then it bears much fruit. Apart from death, we cannot produce the fruit of the kingdom. We cannot produce the fruit of the kingdom unless we learn to die to ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Jesus. And so what I want to do is talk to you practically, give you kind of like four directives of what that looks like. Because to me, I hear die to myself. I'm like, well, how, give me some more. How do I do that? Like, what, what, give me something that I can grab hold of and something that I can do. And so that's what I'm going to try to do is give you four simple things. If these, if you apply these to your life, it will result in you dying to self and fulfilling the mission that God gave you for your life. So number one is pursue God's agenda for your day. Pursue God's agenda for your day. Look, we live, we live where we live. Life here, I feel like, just has so many different things that are required just to, just to live life. Like make sure, that your, that make sure that your health insurance is good and make sure that you have the car insurance and make sure that you renew the, the thing to your car so that your tags aren't expired and you can keep driving. And make sure, like there's just so many things that kind of keep us busy, keep our minds busy and our minds occupied. One of my best friends one time told me, he said, hey, do you want to know an acronym for busy? Do you know what it actually means? I was like, yeah, tell me what it actually means. Busy means busy under Satan's yoke. Stay bit. I think, I think Satan loves just to keep us busy, keep us under the yoke of his busyness where we're never actually focused on what we're supposed to be focused on because we're just busy getting through life and just going, 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 going busy under Satan's yoke. We have to pursue God's agenda for our day. Are you going to the grocery store to get your groceries or are you going to the grocery store to be a light and to shine and get your groceries while you're there? 
It's a subtle difference, but it makes a huge, it, it changes everything about what you do. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my father. So Jesus nourishment and energy came from following the leadership of his father. And I think that some of us are malnourished Christians simply because we are not feeding on the will of our father and accomplishing his will for our lives each and every day. We feel like maybe God is, is distant and he isn't near to us. And I think the answer to that might come from Matthew chapter 28. It's the great commission. What does it say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The promise of his presence to being with us is directly tied to the fulfilling of the mission that he gave us. So if you feel distant from God, I would encourage you to ask yourself, am I walking in the mission that he gave me? And I think that a lot of times when we're not, like I have recognized in my life, when I am getting out of what God has called me to do, I don't feel good. I just, it's, it's plain as day. And no joke, I'll be like, man, I, you know, and now that I'm starting to think about it, I really haven't shared my faith with anyone in like a couple weeks. I haven't engaged anyone in conversation. Like I've not been a light that is shining. Let's get after it today. And sure enough, I start to recognize he really is right here. Like he's with me. And I think that that comes from those moments where we lean on him more because we're not trying to figure out what do I need to do today. We're trying to figure out, God, what is your agenda for me today? I need your leadership. And when I follow you, my food and my nourishment comes from accomplishing your will. So one is pursue God's agenda for your day. Number two is follow compassion. Follow compassion. When I read the gospels, I see it pretty regularly that Jesus, it says he had compassion on a person or compassion on a crowd. And immediately after that, a miracle often follows. I have learned to follow compassion. Compa like when you're, when you see a person and just your heart is just like, oh man, like, oh. And you're just drawn to that. Like it just, you just have like an instant kind of burden. My advice would be go right there. Every time you feel it, if we can learn to be people who will go follow that feeling, we will see God move. I promise you. And it's always hard because you'll have, you'll feel that. You won't know what to say or what to do. You'll be walking up to this person and you'll just be like, I just feel like I just have to, I feel for you. I just have to talk to you, but you have no idea what to say. And you have to be prepared to look like a fool. But I promise you that God moves through compassion. That is the heart of your father. That is your heart coming into alignment with your father in heaven's heart. We would do well to follow the compassion that we have, regardless of how awkward we think it could be. Pursue God's agenda for your day. Follow compassion. Number three is choose service, not comfort. Choose service, not comfort. Let me tell you something. You probably already know this. Dying is very inconvenient. <laughs> Dying is not comfortable. It really isn't. And I think that we all need to answer a question. Do we want to be comfortable or do we want to be impactful? Do we want to be comfortable people or impactful people? Because what I've learned in my life is when God is ready to use me, I hope you know what, I'm, what I mean when I'm saying that, it's uncomfortable all the time. And Jesus came as a servant, Philippians 2. He humbled himself and became a man and he humbled himself and became a servant, the king of kings, the creator of the universe. Jesus humbled himself and came to serve. And we're created in his image. And we're supposed to be conformed more and more to that image. 
we have to choose service and not comfort. And number four is simply obey. Worship team, you can come up. Number four is just very simply obey. I know this is crazy. I'm not a formula guy. I'm not like a A plus B or maybe one plus two equals three. I'm not a formula guy when it comes to the kingdom, but I have figured out the perfect formula for you to fulfill the mission that God has gave you. I can give you the one step plan. Obey. If you, if you wake up every day and you set your heart and your mind on God's agenda, and, and you, you, you're probably not gonna know what that specifically might mean for today. Maybe you will, maybe he'll tell you, like reach out to this person. Do, maybe he will, but if you just kind of set the posture of your heart on, God, I wanna fulfill your agenda for my life today. And if you follow compassion, and if you choose to serve people and not do what is comfortable, there's gonna come a moment where you're gonna come face to face with an opportunity to be obedient and bring the kingdom or go into self-preservation mode because you don't wanna look like a fool. I promise you, I promise you, God is looking for people. He is looking for a people who will set their minds and their hearts to accomplish his will, to fulfill the mission that we have been given for our lives. And if we will just do those four simple things, you'll find that you are beginning to live a life that is for other people in obedience to God more than yourself. You will begin to die to self more and more and more. And it's a process that we're gonna be on for the rest of our lives. Dying every single day, you have the choice, I have the choice. Am I gonna pick up the instrument of my death today and follow Jesus? Or am I gonna do what I need to get done today? We cannot live a life of impact without dying. This has been probably about two years ago now. I was up in Virginia for work and it was an overnight. I was at a, a conference thing. And I'd finished what we were doing throughout the day. I went to my hotel room. And when I went to go check into my hotel, I went to the counter and the, the guy working there, his name was Christian. And I just, I saw his name tag and I, it was just like, Chris, like Christian, I, sh I need to talk to this guy. I can't explain it. It's just like, this guy needs me to talk to him kinda. And so I didn't really know what to say. There are people behind me in line, kind of went through my, my thing, checked in, went up to my room. Didn't really think much about it. Kind of felt like it was a little bit of a failure, honestly, because I didn't kind of do something right there in that moment. And I just, I had, a, I had some time. I think I had an hour before I had to meet people. So I was just like, I'm just gonna read my Bible, pray, worship, just have some time with Jesus. And so I just was praying. And while I was praying, I had these three thoughts that just came to my head, total random thoughts about this guy, Christian. I had this thought that he came a long way to get here. I had a thought that he lost some friends along the way. And I had a thought that he was about to give up. And I'm like, God, is that you? I wasn't thinking about this guy. I'm not trying to manufacture things, but it was so random. I was like, God, I think that was you. I think I'm gonna go downstairs. And I'm just, I guess, gonna say those three things to this guy, maybe. And so I went downstairs, had no, really no idea what I was gonna do, no idea what was gonna happen. I went downstairs and people are checking in. It's like 5.30. I end up standing there for like a half an hour, waiting for a moment to go talk to this guy. I was gonna be late to the people I was meeting, like choose, surf, choose service. I wanna serve, serve this guy. I have an agenda for my day, but I want God's agenda for my day. So I finally see this opening to this kid named Christian. I think he's like 19. And I went up to him, I was like, hey man, look, my name's Wes and I follow Jesus. And I feel like he told me some things about you and I'd like to run them by you and see what you think. He's like, okay. And so I told him, I said, hey, I feel like you came a really long way to get here. I feel like you lost some important relationships along the way and I feel like you're ready to give up. Does that make any sense to you? Does that mean anything to you? He was like, yeah, it really does. I did, I came a very long way to get here and I lost my best friend in the process. And then he said, I woke up this morning because I've been wanting to hear from God. And I told him that if he didn't speak to me today, I was done. 
And I'm like, well, that's great. He's speaking to you, buddy. And then I went on and then that happens. Like sometimes you just got to take the step of I have no clue what is going to happen right now. And then God will begin to show you what's going to happen in this situation and what you can do. And then I was able to minister to this kid. And the reason that I'm telling you that story <clears throat> is because when I drove past the girl in the Chick-fil-A line, I immediately thought of him. What if she woke up that morning and was like, God, I've been searching for you. I've been looking for answers and you're silent. If you don't speak to me today, I'm done. I'm, I'm not trying to be dramatic, guys. Those are real stories. That stuff really happened. The world really needs the answers that we have. They really need Jesus. And he has given you his authority. He is speaking to you. I am nothing special. I promise you. I fail way more than I succeed in being obedient to what Jesus tells me to do. You can't look at me and think I'm anything special. I'm exactly like you. You have the same Jesus inside of you as I do. And he has given you his authority and he has sent you. And just like the 12 and just like the 72 and just like people for generations before us, if we go, his kingdom will come. I promise you his kingdom will come. So we're gonna respond right now. Prayer team, you can come on up. You all can stand with me. Just a couple ideas for you during this time of response. Number one, you may need to repent. Maybe you're, come, you're at a place right now where you're like, man, I have not been doing what God has been asking me to do. I've been timid. I've allowed fear to rule me and I have been silent and ashamed of the gospel. If that is you, confession to your brothers and sisters will bring healing. So if you wanna come up and confess that, they would love to walk you through repentance and pray for you. And then if you just want prayer for just like boldness or strength, or excitement, or even a desire for stuff like this, they would love to come pray, pray for you. So go ahead and come on up and they will pray for you. We can do this, guys. We can make Jesus known right here in Holly Springs, in Fuquay, in Apex. We are his chosen instrument. So let's do it.
You know, someone asked me a question one time. They said, how do you build confidence with God, like in God? And there's only one way to do that, and that's by building a history with Him. Taking chances, risk it. You're going to miss it. But I guarantee a way that you will miss it, 100%, if you never try, if you never step out. Take a chance, risk. I love what Wes said. If you want to be impactful, you have to be uncomfortable. You have to choose that. And so this week, man, just step out, take little chances. Be ready, be embarrassed. Like, how many people in here like to be embarrassed? Raise your hand. Wow, no one. But it's worth taking a chance if it changes someone's life. We have to stop loving our own comfort more than we love, love other people. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that today's service was an encouragement and a blessing to you, and we would love for you to share it with your friends and family. If you have any prayer requests, testimonies, or anything you'd like to share, send us an email at hello at verticallife.church or reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We hope you guys have an awesome week. See you next time.